a priori and a posteriori tests. Um, you know, using Latin makes sound, something sound very fancy, but um, the concept is actually fairly simple. So let's say we're doing a one-way ANOVA. And we have three groups. And let's make the groups uh, something like a control group and, who knows, a couple of sugars. Let's say sucrose and fructose. And we're looking at something like, you know, growth of some stem segments or something like that. I think your book might use an example like that. <clears throat> so go in Rolf's biometry book. So if we plot the means and, and we kind of imagine, you know, we're going to expect the sugars to produce some kind of a stimulation of growth of the pea stem segments because they represent a source of carbohydrates, right? So we have some kind of a expectation for stimulation of growth. Sorry, those aren't very neat. Um, when we do an analysis of variance, we're asking the question, um, could these three samples have been drawn from a parametric population with the same, um, with, with a single um, mean mu? And um, let's say we reject that. Let's say we find that, uh, in fact, um, the means differ. There is, there is some variation among means. Well, that's somewhat satisfying, but it doesn't actually tell us which means differ from what other means. And even with um, uh, three groups, one could make many comparisons. One could compare control versus sucrose, sucrose versus fructose, and control versus fructose. One could imagine if one had four groups, then you could actually make even more uh, comparisons, right? Um, in fact, the number of comparisons possible is n times n minus 1 over 2. Um, so here, for example, we have uh, three groups. I should say a, I suppose, a times a minus 1. Uh, so we have three groups, and we have 3 minus 1 divided by 2, or 3 times 2 divided by 2, or three comparisons that we could make. But you can, you can imagine if we had a equals 4, that goes up quite a bit. So we have 4 times 3 divided by 2. Suddenly we have 6 comparisons. If we have 5 times 4 divided by 2, we have 10 comparisons and so forth. So as the number of groups goes up, the number of comparisons we can make increases a lot. So what happens when you start making lots and lots of comparisons? Well, if we set alpha equals 0 0.05, um, what happens is that pretty soon, if you're making 10 comparisons, you're going to find a difference where, by chance, um, when one actually doesn't exist. And so um, that's why we have to be careful about um, making many comparisons, and it's why there are actually two kinds of classes of means comparisons um, that we will make after the fact, after we've performed an ANOVA. So does that mean that you can only make one comparison? Um, and, and then beyond that, you would have to adjust for the number of comparisons you make? Actually, no. And so this is where uh, a priori comparisons come in. If you plan the comparisons, so this is another term used to describe these, if they are planned comparisons, then you can make more than just one without compounding your probability of making a type 1 error. And let, let me explain, though. It has to be a particular kind of comparison. So, for example, let's say we wanted to compare controls versus sugars because we had a hypothesis that, you know, controls would be less than um, the growth of stem segments stimulated by sugars. But we also want to compare sucrose versus fructose. And what we're going to show 
with my next video is that uh, as long as those comparisons are orthogonal, we can make multiple comparisons. Okay, and in particular, we can do that if these are planned comparisons done beforehand. Um, and one can easily imagine before one carried out this experiment that one would plan to compare the controls to the sugar groups and then subsequently also compare sucrose to fructose. And when I say um, this is orthogonal, what that ensures is that those comparisons are independent of one another. And that orthogonality uh, is going to require a test. We're going to have to develop a test for that, which I will present in a separate video on orthogonality. Right now, though, I want to move on to uh, a posteriori test because most often, most often one is doing an ANOVA and then doing some comparisons among means. In other words, typically you don't know exactly what means you want to compare to what means because you're not sure what's interesting until you get your ANOVA results. Um, so with a posteriori tests, um, we can still improve our statistical power a little bit um, to do tests if we um, select the appropriate test. So let me give you a kind of a key to the um, a posteriori after the fact, after we've done our ANOVA uh, tests. So the first question we ask ourselves is, do you want to compare each treatment to one specific mean? For each group, let's say each group to one specific group. And if the answer to that is yes, and, and by the way, these um, tests are the ones given by um, our computer program that we're using in this class, uh, SAS Jump. Other computer programs may have other a posteriori tests they give you, but they will often be in these same classes. So if you just want to compare each group to one group, um, that gives you a little bit um, more power. And then we can ask ourselves, is the one group a control? In other words, is it controlling for something that the others are varying? Um, if we want to do, if the answer to that question is yes, it's a control, we do what's called Dunnett's test. Okay? And if the other group is not a control, um, we can use something called Shoes MCB. And that stands for multiple comparisons with best. I'll put best in quotes. Um, so in this case, you designate which is the group you want to compare to. And it's either a low group or a high group in terms of the means. So best could be the lowest number, the lowest mean, or it could be the highest mean and you compare with just the lowest or just the highest. In Dunnett's test, the control group can be in the middle, it can be wherever, but in Shoes MCB, it's at one end of the mean spectrum. Okay, so here we've answered no. One of the groups is not a control, but we still want to limit our number of comparisons and compare with one group. Might be a maximum or a minimum in the case of Shoes MCB. Okay, so let's say we don't want to compare with just one group. Then um, we have to ask ourselves, do we want a liberal test? Or, kind of contradicting that, a conservative test. So let's say, let's just take it from the liberal standpoint and say, yes, we want a liberal test. Um, in other words, alpha will be the same, for example, 0.05, 
and that's just an example. We can vary that. But it'll be the same for all comparisons. And as a result, we could um, commit a type 1 error because we're doing multiple tests. So we would do student's t-test as an example. Um, student's t-test would, um, for when done repeatedly for each pair, be a very liberal test. Liberal in the sense that we would be more likely to find a difference, but we would also be more likely to make an error in terms of a type 1 error, saying there's a difference when in fact there's not. Because we're repeating, we're repeating the test over and over and we're not adjusting alpha. So if we want to be conservative, and, and scientists often want to be conservative in this sense anyway, we want to be conservative, I'm going to get rid of that. there we go, um, we want alpha to be adjusted so that alpha for all comparisons combined, in other words, sometimes um, that's called the experiment-wise or experiment-wide error rate is kept at 0.05. In other words, our probability across all the comparisons we make um, is 0.05. Um, typically, we would use something like Tukey uh, Kramer HSD. And this is, HSD stands for Honestly significant difference. I love the sense of humor um, uh, that statisticians have as if they're being dishonest when they do the students to they're not. They're just being less conservative. <laughs> but um, when one makes lots of comparisons, um, say for example, you have five groups, you know, group A, B, C, D, E, and you're comparing all these means and you do an ANOVA and you find there's significant variation among means and you want to see which ones are different from which, um, you would, for example, do a, a posteriori test that might show that um, we have um, means with the same letters are not significantly different, you know, something like that. Um, we would put error bars on here, of course, too, and we have our Y bar plotted, and there's our group. Um, but these letters might be assigned by something like a Tukey Kramer HSD, and our chance for this whole graph of producing a single type 1 error uh, would be 0.05. Okay, so we've adjusted for the fact that we're comparing lots of different means here. By the way, how many are we comparing when we have five groups? 5 times 4 divided by 2, 20 divided by 2, 10, 10 different comparisons one can possibly make here. And so the Tukey Kramer HSD. Um, is probably the one used most often in SAS Jump. Um, different computer programs use different ones, but I wanted to kind of point out that there are actually um, four different a posteriori tests that are presented in Jump, and some of them may preserve a little more statistical power for you to detect differences if, for example, you have controls or if you want to compare to the fastest group or some such thing. All right, so that is our a posteriori comparisons. As I mentioned, I will talk about orthogonality for planned comparisons in a separate video. Bye-bye.